Good afternoon. I'm Darylyn Moyer. I'm the CEO and EVP of the American College of Physicians, and I'm the president-elect of CMSS. I'm really excited about this afternoon plenary um, on digital transformation, virtual education. Uh, we have three fabulous speakers this afternoon, so I'm going to quickly uh, introduce them, and then I'm going to hand it to them for some presentations, and then we'll have some time for Q&A at the end. Um, Dr. Vinita Rora, MD, MAPP, and MACP, is an academic hospitalist who specializes in improving the learning environment for medical trainees and the quality, safety, and experience of care delivered to hospitalized adults. She's an internationally recognized expert on patient handoffs in healthcare and also has extensive expertise using technology such as social media to improve workplace learning and teaching hospitals on a variety of topics. Her educational videos on handoffs, supervision, professionalism, and costs of care have been used by numerous educators around the country and been, have been featured on NPR and the New York Times. She's an accomplished researcher and has served as the principal investigator of numerous federal and foundation research grants. Most notably, Dr. Aurora has developed tools to evaluate handoff quality among hospitalists and residents. She's also investigating the effect of sleep loss on hospitalized patients and is working to create novel interventions to optimize patient experience in hospitals through workplace learning and systems change. Her academic work has resulted in dozens of peer reviewed publications and she has been recognized with a multitude of national awards. She's testified to Congress on the primary care um, crisis and she's had innumerable features uh, in peer reviewed publications. She is a master to the Academy of Distinguished Medical Educators at the University of Chicago and a member of the National Academy of Medicine. Another speaker today will be Dr. Rishi Desai, MD, MPH. He is a pediatric infectious diseases physician with a public health background who currently serves as the chief medical officer at Osmosis and recently led Khan Academy Medicine. Dr. Desai had an accelerated education, completing high school and receiving his BS in microbiology and molecular genetics from UCLA by the age of 18. He completed his medical training at UCSF and went to work at medical centers, including Boston Children's, Boston Medical Center, the Children's Hospital of Los Angeles and Stanford University. He earned his MPH in epidemiology at UCLA, spent two years at the CDC um, and as an EIS, that's an Epidemic Intelligence Service Officer, investigating disease outbreaks before beginning his work on online medical education. As the Osmosis Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Desai leads the development of content creation, public outreach, and strategic growth. Osmosis generates open-ended videos and questions that are available in multiple languages and serves as a personalized learning engine for over 1 million medical students, clinicians, and caregivers around the world. As a company, Osmosis seeks to empower this population with the best learning experience possible, and Dr. Desai plays a vital role in this mission. When he's not in the park with his three-year-old son, Rishi is eating raspberries and learning Mandarin. And finally, Dr. Daniel Kraft. He is a Stanford and Harvard trained physician scientist, inventor, entrepreneur, and innovator. And he is now serving as the chair of the XPRIZE Pandemic Alliance Task Force. With over 25 years of experience in clinical practice, biomedical research, and healthcare innovation, Dr. Kraft has chaired Medicine for Singularity University since its, its inception in 2008, and is a founder and chair of Exponential Medicine, a program that explores convergent, rapidly developing technologies and their potential in biomedicine and healthcare. Following undergraduate degrees from Brown University and Medical School at Stanford, Dr. Kraft was board certified in both internal medicine and pediatrics after completing a Harvard residency at MGH in Boston Children's. And then he went on to complete a fellowship 
in hematology, oncology, and bone marrow transplantation at Stanford. We're re really excited to um, hear their thoughts. Um, the panel today is going to focus on how COVID-19 pandemic has opened up opportunities to transform education. They're going to give us their insights into what challenges have been encountered and what the opportunities are for now and the future. And I do believe um, uh, Dr. Kraft is going to be our first speaker. Great. Um, thanks so much for having me. Um, I'm going to try and kick things off with a little bit of a, a quick framing talk um, around uh, the future of health, medical specialties, and a bit about how COVID has been um, accelerating uh, where we might head. So um, thematically, of course, uh, we live in an interesting time. Uh, technologies all around us have been accelerating, sometimes exponentially. We've seen entire other fields uh, reach the fourth industrial age from how we do our banking to do how we do our movies. Um, often health and medicine feel stuck a bit in the third uh, industrial age. And certainly COVID uh, has been a huge challenge for all of us in many ways, but has the potential uh, to unlock and, and its silver lining uh, unleash some positive elements. I love this slide, who led the digital transformation of your company, the CEO, the CTO, or COVID-19, and certainly COVID has been uh, providing us uh, not just the usual challenges, but additional ones, but does give us a potential lens, I think going forward, uh, to, uh, to reshape health and medicine and medical education. Um, part of that's you know, thinking how we structure our facilities. I helped chair a session a year or two ago on the future of the hospital with CEOs of hospital systems from around the world. And part of our takeaway is the future of the hospital is no longer going to be the hospital. We're clearly moving into this virtual era that's been catalyzed by, by COVID from hospital to hospital uh, or hospital to home or from lab to laptop. But if we start where we are in 2020, you know, when I go back and visit Mass General Hospital and the White Nine Ward, you know, we're still using fax machines, uh, still often have to use paper forms to enter into the EMR later. Uh, I recently had my own cardiac study done and I only could get the results in a CD-ROM. I don't even own a CD-ROM player anymore. Uh, and of course, even in 2020, we're using the same public health measures we had in 1918. So we have, we still are, are somewhat living in the past, but Hopefully, just as Sputnik set off the space age, COVID can potentially spark a new health age by uh, 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 giving us some new visibility into the, the challenges and, and the opportunity space. Part of that, I think, is a bit of our mindset, how we might shift from well, we really practice sick care to one of true health care. Sick care is in our model of you know waiting rooms uh, and uh, old silos where we sort of uh, use very intermittent and episodic data, usually only in the clinic, the ER, the ICU. Uh, so our intermittent episodic data leads to a sort of reactive model where we wait for the patient to show up with a heart attack, the stroke, or my world of oncology, advanced cancer, or we wait for the pandemic to arrive. And, and big picture, I think what's already here now and what's being catalyzed is to use some of our new continuous data forms to be much more personalized proact and proactive for the individual, for, for the public health realm, and to start to bring uh, care m much more anytime, anywhere, arguably at lower cost with lower outcomes. A lot of this is riding, you know, what's often termed exponential technologies. The fact, you know, that our smartphone supercomputers can do more and more. What used to fit on your desktop in 2000 now fits on your smartwatch, which is increasingly becoming an FDA clear device. Um, and if we use that sort of mindset, uh, we can, again, restructure elements of health, medicine, education, and, and our response to COVID. Clearly, some of these technologies are now interconnected. You've heard of the Internet of Things. We're now on the Internet of Medical Things, riding 5G. Not everyone obviously has that, so it's not just about the social determinants of health, but the digital determinants of health. But as we're all aware, we're now over-challenged with data, often massive amounts of data that's still siloed. So one of our core opportunities is to hopefully address interoperability to connect, whether it's our public health data or our billing, our telemedicine elements, and hopefully potentially sometimes find the missing information that's already there if we could just extract it, whether it's around cancer or COVID. And, and big picture, I think, what is being catalyzed by COVID is to take this exponential data sets, turn them more quickly into actionable information you can use at the point of care uh, or in your hospital system, uh, and narrow the gap between something we've learned to being clinical knowledge, like all the lessons learned in the ICUs at Wuhan and then Italy came back to New York and then have improved the outcomes for, for COVID patients on the ground. Of course, all this new data can lead to this sort of infodemic on top of this, sometimes uh, uh, intentional by bad actors. So how do we meld all this going forward? And how do we bring this, of course, in the new incentives from hospital to home to our phone to even inside our bodies is, is overlaying with this new era of what's often called 
uh, you know, connected mobile or digital health, that we can start to connect these dots in new forms and apply these new information sources and apps and services that match the individual. Um, the, the, and, and it's not, of course, about digital, it's this convergence of all these fields that I'll touch on briefly for education, AR, VR, uh, synthetic biology, big data, AI. How do we put those together in new forms uh, to, to make sense of them and make them actionable? Um, I'm chairing the XPRIZE Pandemic Alliance Task Force made up of 100 organizations, many academics, big companies, small ones, to think about how do we connect the dots between uh, a lot of the thousands of flowers are blooming to, to find the best ones and catalyze those uh, forward, including uh, addressing the, the, the infodemic. Um, and some of the lessons we've taken to that is that healthcare, of course, is a team sport. We often live in our own silos in terms of medical specialties. Mm -hmm. But how do we start to collaborate better? I run a program called Exponential Medicine. Thematically, it's how do we bring folks from all sorts of realms to, to, to move forward. On the exponential, of course, we now in the world of, of wearables, I'm wearing four of them at the moment, um, they can now start to measure almost every element of physiology and behavior, even picking up forms of COVID from our biological footprints. The challenge for all of us, and I think in the medical specialties is what, going forward, is how do we go from the sort of data geeks amongst us who have most of our Fitbit data on our smart devices quantified selfers and shift that to quantified health. So this continuous flow will serve us uh, better forms of picking up, uh, optimizing health through digital biomarkers, diagnosing disease early, whether it's infectious disease or uh, cancer, and then therapy can be much more real-time data-driven and intelligent and a learning engine. And of course, it doesn't take complex devices, a simple wearable, uh, you're sending someone home after a COVID uh, in, uh, discharge or a, a hip replacement, are they walking more as expected or walking less? And can you use that small data to intervene on the folks who are not? Um, we're going from wearables even to my favorite underwearables. You know, these internet of medical things devices are so small, you get a pack of 10, put them in 10 pairs of underwear. They were starting as consumer devices for mindfulness. Now they're in the era of remote patient monitoring can be used to monitor patients who have respiratory distress, whether that's COPD or COVID. So all these new tools are here. Some of them you don't need to wear anything. The idea of um, you know, your, your smartphone listening to your voice or your cough can tell you if that's a COVID cough or a, a common cold. Bottom line is we're already overwhelmed with wearables and sightables to invisibles. Our digital exhaust from our patients will start to be collected 24 seven. What do we do with that? As clinicians, we don't want more data. Here's a cartoon, you know, just as I thought you're generating too much data, we want the insights from that. We need to integrate that smartly into our workflow. And I think hopefully COVID is a lens to, to, to start paying attention to bringing not just data, but actionable information to the clinical setting. And in synthesizing and engaging the patient as well to have their own sort of personal check engine lights, synthesizing multiple data streams uh, going forward, all the way to your early detection from your wearable that can pick up asymptomatic uh, COVID patients. A really interesting point where I think this comes together for the future of med ed, medical education is how do we make this you know, easy and, and uh, digestible? Uh, augmented virtual and extended reality is exploded on the scene. You all remember your antique Google Glass, you know, here's mine. But you know, they can be used to enhance the clinician experience. They can have scribes and not write notes, all the way now to enhancing what surgeons can do to overlap uh, real-time, uh, uh, let's say, CT and MRI data with their patient to guide them through procedures or to, uh, in, the, in the healthcare environment to educate nurses, doctors, medical students have a virtual patient with COVID uh, that they can sort of practice on in sort of a, a very engaging non-textbook manner. Um, or to uh, engage our patients to understand what's happening in their own bodies through augmented and virtual reality, whether it's walking through their own brain or understanding the course of an infectious disease. So lots of new ways to engage our patients and uh, medical education using AR, VR, and XR. Virtual reality, of course, is now here. You, I've just got my $200, $300 Oculus Quest. It's fun to put grandma on roller coaster, but VR can increasingly be used as a lens for um, therapy, uh, pain therapy, physical therapy. Uh, and of course, in med ed, you know, you can now you know, walk through your heart. This is the Stanford Visual Heart Pro Project. Um, you can uh, live stream surgeries or other procedures. So we can start to democratize medical education, that's being catalyzed. You can do coaching through an iPad or through a, a surgical platform. And of course, there's now even video games that for doctors, uh, which, uh, which are getting really compelling. And many medical students are now on these platforms to learn procedures or to simulate, uh, instead of going into an operating room and practicing a procedure for the first time, to go in there in a VR environment and, and dramatically catalyze, uh, not see one, do one, teach one as we train, but see one, Sim one, sim one, sim one, just like uh, uh, pilots do in flight simulators. 
And where I think this will take us is to crowdsource this information, build a bit of a ways for clinicians, guiding step by step, whether it's an ICU setting or a procedural setting, going sort of from driver assist to doctor assist. And I'm running low on time. Uh, I'll just shift to all the new tools, of course, in diagnostics. Uh, we can leverage in COVID from our COVID kits, which are increasingly integrating into virtual care. So it's not just the smart smartphone screen, but using platforms like Tido Care to augment the exam and care of our patients, to all the labs that are coming to our mobile devices, even the idea of the, the medical selfie where our smartphone cameras can increasingly replace a urinalysis uh, and just enable that to be done at home and send the data directly to you. Um, the, the final component, of course, is all this data is overwhelming. We need new forms to make sense of this. Uh, AI is obviously a buzzword. I like to think of it more as IA, intelligence augmentation. Uh, I think that's being catalyzed in the era of COVID, whether it's for radiology uh, or for uh, public health measures. I think the future of all this will be a, sort of a synthesis of a digital twin where each of our patients will be sort of modeled in the cloud and we'll use that to do better prevention, diagnostics, and therapy. Not to replace doctors, nurses, and beyond, but to augment what we can do. I think AI is not going to replace doctors, but doctors using AI will replace those who don't. Finally, in the realm of therapy, um, we're obviously, many of us, learning how to do uh, not just bedside manner, but website manner. Telemedicine's exploding uh, in this setting uh, by, by the very nature. I think we're going to have to learn how to blend that with asynchronous care, the chatbots, which will do your initial review of systems. Um, all the way to, to, to behavioral health. And because we're starting to prescribe apps in these virtual services, it's a bit overwhelming. Um, I recently launched a new program platform called Digital.Health. It's sort of an early version of a digital health formulary where you can start to learn about and find and eventually start to prescribe the digital health tools and connected elements that are already out there uh, in the world. My last minute I'll, I'll try and summarize is, I think COVID is hopefully accelerating how we're gonna learn to speed up clinical trials in the future. Um, we're already in the era now of virtualized trials, uh, globalizing those, and in a sense, we're starting to crowdsource a medicine, just like we don't drive anymore with paper maps. We're used to Waze and, um, and, uh, and Google Maps. I think we can take some of our ability to crowdsource data, become data donors within our systems, or as patients and individuals, to build sort of a, a smarter, uh, connected learning engine that will en enhance public health and, and, and uh, human health going forward. So. Think exponentially, think of the convergence of all these technologies. It's really gonna shift how we do care from reactive to proactive and change medical education going forward as well. So thanks very much. Thank you for that incredible whirlwind tour and very much appreciated all your points and particularly how COVID-19 in 10 months uh, catalyzed things that hadn't happened in 10 years in, in our system. So thank you for, for that incredible whirlwind uh, of really intriguing, fascinating information. Our next speaker uh, is Dr. Um, Rishi Desai, and I'm looking forward to his presentation. I think he's going to talk about a nonlinear approach to learning um, and the use of short experiential videos to support just in time learning, and of course, the all important flipping the clinic. So, Dr. Desai, take it away. Thank you. And uh, in terms of presenting, do you have the slides on your end available? And if not, I can pull them up on my end as well. We had you set to self-present, but I'm happy to pull them up in advance for you. Oh, here, let me, let me actually see if I can pull them up. That might be quicker. Thank you. Let's see if I can grab them. And while I get started, I'll say that I was watching Daniel's uh, presentation and, and loving it. Some of those images are, uh, are ones that I've seen before, but I don't think I've gone through them the way that you did. So it was actually kind of nice to see another person present some of the stuff that I've uh, looked at, but in a, in a very creative way, that was, uh, that was excellent. Uh, okay, so let me see if I can share a screen with y'all. And I'm gonna just let me know if you can see my screen properly. Does that come across well? Yes, we can see. Awesome. So. You know, when, when you asked me to come and speak, I was thinking about how to synthesize between what Daniel's going to say and and, um, and what's going to come next with, I think, even more granularity from Vinny. But the, the idea I want to pr propose is essentially flipping the clinic, which is to say, you know, in a pre-COVID era, we had this notion of telemedicine. And now I think telemedicine just absolutely exploded. So that's just one very clear example. Uh, and I don't think we're going to go back to a, a pre-COVID era where people are going to not look at telemedicine in the, in the way that they do now as kind of a first pass um, and first kind of go-to approach. So how I've been using 
telemedicine is as follows. And I work at osmosis, as you know, but I also do work with American Well. So I'm just going to talk about that experience. Um, broadly speaking, there are two things you can do to increase productivity. You can have more workers or you can have more effective workers. And I think we have a need for both. You know, clearly America is getting older, so is the rest of the world. And so it's called the graying of America. And so we need to deal with that with more healthcare workers on the one hand and workforce acceleration programs uh, are, are necessary and osmosis is working on that. But separately, how do you actually make the workers that are out there more effective? And that's what this presentation is about. So we have this sense of uh, video-based learning and, and typically, you know, I've noticed that when I went back through my old med school lectures, you could find a lecture that was an hour long and if you really kind of boiled it down, you can kind of get it across in about six minutes or seven minutes. And, and that's really how students are learning. This is kind of an example of different types of these little short videos. Most med schools, and I, I'd query the, the audience, just if you know the answer, it'd be interesting to hear your thoughts. What percentage of students attend med school? Simple question. You know, and that's whether you're at Stanford or UCLA or U University of Michigan. What, what percentage of students are actually sitting in classrooms today? And just think of that number, what, whatever percentage you have in your head. And the answer is it's not 100, clearly. So some pr proportion is, is kind of not going. And that proportion is growing of people that don't attend. Right now, it's around 10 to 15% of students attend lectures. So it begs the question, what are the other 85 or 90% doing? And this is pre-COVID, right? So this is, has nothing to do with COVID. Already you saw this huge swing towards learning on your own, bite-sized learning. You grab a video, you find it, you consume it, you move on. These are very short videos. In fact, there's research on how short and how quick you know, these videos ought to be. Um, that shows typically if you have a video that's let's say around six to nine minutes, that's when you get your peak engagement. Once the videos start going nine to 12 minutes or 12 to 40 minutes, you start to lose people's attention. And, and you know, even think about you know, this very presentation where I'm gonna speak to you probably for six to nine minutes. It's not gonna go beyond that. And then we'll switch it up and then we'll go to question and answer. We all recognize intuitively our attention spans are generally in that range. So that's one piece of evidence that we've kind of employed. Another is the style of video. So when you're talking about a presentation where you're actually building new knowledge, actually trying to explain to someone you know, something that they're not familiar with, and it's not kind of a more higher level talk like what this is, in those situations, you really wanna create um, a tutorial that is building from scratch, almost like what these animations do. They kind of draw out what it is that you're supposed to be focusing on, and they kind of explore out like what that should be versus a PowerPoint deck. A PowerPoint deck is typically much better for just presenting kind of high level ideas. So that's kind of what a TED style talk would be or what we're even doing today. So generally that style of video where you're building up through animation, drawing it out, literally kind of pointing at the thing that you're trying to focus on, it is much more effective at engaging people. And then finally, the pace at which you speak. I mean, even, even take for granted or take for example, you know, Daniel's pace versus my pace. My pace is a little slower. Daniel's would be more engaging, frankly. So you can see speaking rate is in the 200 words per minute range is where you get peak engagement. And so what we see with students is that they typically will watch a video presentation from someone like me at 2x, or if it's someone like Daniel at 1.5x, they're basically all kind of aligning towards the same final number and trying to get that, that information across in the 185 to 250 word per minute range. We see this all the time. So this is something that students are intuitively kind of gravitating towards. And so what we do with our presentations is try to aim for something that when sped up would still actually be understandable and knowing that that's gonna be something that they're gonna probably wanna do anyway. And typically they'll watch something multiple times. So they'll watch it all the way through, maybe 1.5 or 2X and they'll watch it again and they'll watch it again. And they might just focus on the, like, the parts that were confusing or of interest which probably resonates with a lot of people that might scrub through a video just to find that part of the video that you found interesting. So these are behaviors of learners. So how do you then kind of take all this and apply it to what people do? At the outset, I said, you either have more workers or more effective workers. So this is just a schematic of how I as a clinician might spend time with a patient. Maybe a quarter of my time is on the history, maybe a small little wedge is on the physical exam. Maybe I spend a lot of time on general education, just kind of explaining the background of what's going on. 
And then there's some assessment of plan of sort of how does that relate to them? So this is a kind of a, a symbolic wheel of like how I would spend my time. And actually I started mapping this out and measuring this for myself. And we've been doing this for a handful of uh, clinicians just to get a sense of like, how do people spend their time? So now enter the video. Let's say I send a video to someone and say, hey, you need to be, let's say this is a patient with tuberculosis. You need to take isoniazid. Here's a video on tuberculosis. So this is the patient education part, right? So just kind of going back, that's that general education, which is actually kind of the meaty part of this entire experience, right? So now that's a video. They go home with that video as part of their prescription. And it was working well. Clinically, this was actually going really well. I was enjoying this experience and sending patients home with these little videos. And then it occurred to me, like, why am I sending them out with these videos? Why not actually put the video up front? And so I would give them a video the night before they came in for a clinic appointment, and then we'd have the appointment. And literally what happened is, is things shifted almost immediately. I had 15, 16 year old uh, kids or teenagers saying, hey, so I noticed that my LFTs are elevated. I'm guessing that you're gonna wanna switch from isoniazid to rifampin. And it just took me back. I was like, oh my gosh, yeah, that's exactly right. And I didn't have to ask, how did you know that? It's in the video. So in the video, you can kind of get that basic knowledge and then people can come in and they know the plan. A, it saves a lot of time. And in fact, I started measuring the time that it saved because now I could just go from history to physical to assessment and plan. And then B, a lot of the assessment and plan was coming from the patient. They were saying, so I see that I need to do these things. Like this would be the next appropriate step. And in many cases, especially in the field of infectious diseases where I'm not doing a procedure, it really kind of got rid of the need for them to come into the appointment. They could just text me, they could call me, you know, to a lot of the points that Daniel was making, it doesn't need to be this very stagnant, sterile visit that occurs every six months or every one year, where I do a check-in. All of a sudden I could just check in by phone. And then three weeks later, they would say, hey, I just noticed that my, my tears are orange, but based on the video, that seems normal, right? Right. So these are the sort of micro check-ins that started happening. And all of a sudden my appointments started looking much more like all my other interactions with, with people in my life, you know, through text, small little snippets. It didn't have to be this exhaustive thing that occurred at a very kind of discrete time point, And then I wouldn't see them later. So this is what I started noticing. And it, it really made a huge difference because people started getting much more comfortable with owning and really having full sense of responsibility over their care. Now, I mentioned at the outset telemedicine, and we know now that a lot of these appointments are happening in the era of COVID through telemedicine. So my sense is that this is just going to explode over time. We're going to see more and more education happening in micro little bits, like what I described. It's going to happen over the internet, and it's going to happen kind of exactly when and where the patient wants it to happen. And so this is kind of the final point I wanted to make is that we're seeing this in terms of how to make care much more accessible and much more, um, I think, delivered in a way that patients want and kind of in line with all their other communications. Because uh, as was said earlier, again, medicine has been fairly set back from all the advances we see in the rest of our lives in terms of the quality of education, the, the way that medicine occurs. And so I think we're finally with COVID starting to catch up. And I think telemedicine is probably the best story to tell on, on how that's happening. So that's where I wanted to end and, and you're welcome to send me questions as well. Wonderful, thank you for that great talk. Wow, we've come a long way since I'm a PGY 36 now and very, very different educational environment. Um, but trying to adapt uh, and look forward. So that was a fabulous presentation, thank you. We're now going to um, have Dr. Aurora talk to us about some of the socio-cultural um, view on the models of med ed, including how to incorporate new ideas into academia and specialty societies, the use of CME accredited tweet chats and the need for faculty development as medical educators. Take it away, Dr. Aurora. Thank you so much, and uh, I'm truly honored to be here, and uh, especially with these uh, esteemed guests, um, Daniel and Rishi, talking about things from everywhere from ways uh, and um, uh, medical selfies all the way to flipping the clinic um, definitely speaks to me in terms of um, the need for rapid innovation in our field, not just in medical education, but also in patient care and research, uh, which I know that um, many of you have been talking about. 
Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, the importance of social learning and networking during a pandemic. And the reason, um, you know, even though we're talking about technology, I think it's also important to think about when we switch to learning through technology, what is lost? And what do we need to put back in deliberately? And so, and that's where I turn to social learning. And so you might wonder, why do I think about this? I think about this a lot. And the reason I think about this is that uh, right downstairs, I have a six-year-old who is um, um, in, in remote learning, in virtual learning. And so one of the big challenges um, when you are dealing with um, remote learning is how are you going to not just deliver the knowledge? I think that Rishi did an excellent job highlighting, you know, the cadence and the pace of your voice. And so now I'm wondering if I, if I actually have that right cadence. Uh, but, but also there's that social learning, the social element, the cohort effect, how people learn together. Um, and so, um, so uh, social emotional learning is not a new concept. It actually comes from the K through 12 literature from the National Education Association, but it's espoused in adult learning as well. And so I bring it here because uh, one, medical students sort of are bridging this divide, but also many of you are running professional conferences and running them virtually for the first time. And I think one of the things we have found is that, you know, you can deliver great content virtually, but how do you recreate the meeting? How do you recreate the thirst for knowledge and wanting to get all that information? And so, um, there, the collaborative on academic, social, and emotional learning defines socio-emotional learning as how adults learn to understand and manage emotions, set goals, show empathy for others, um, establish positive relationships, and make responsible decisions. And so if you think about it, um, and some of you I know have been um, in academia before, or certainly in uh, leadership positions prior to your society roles. And when you think about hiring uh, physicians or um, healthcare professionals, that's what you want to train for. You want somebody who's professionally competent, but also has this, um, you know, emotional IQ. And a lot of that is learned by networking at these conferences, as well as in our spaces. And so this is what we call the castle framework or the castle wheel. And so it really goes through the five core competencies in socio-emotional learning. So self-management, uh, the ability to regulate your emotions. And even though this is used in K through 12, I can tell you probably are thinking about specific people who don't have this um, and how they've run into trouble. And so you need to be able to self-regulate your emotions, thoughts, and behaviors, manage stress. We know that's such an issue. Um, social awareness, how do you take perspective and empathize with others, um, especially from diverse backgrounds and cultures, this whole understanding of equity and how do we um, address some of the implicit biases that we carry, that's all about social awareness. Relationship skills, the ability to establish and maintain healthy and rewarding relationships with diverse individuals and groups, not just our patients, but also interprofessional teams and some of those teaming competencies. Um, responsible decision making, so how do you make constructive choices about your personal behavior and social interactions and, um, and including safety concerns and social norms. And so I can only think right now in the pandemic, um, how can we train people for responsible decision making um, and masking and doing all those great things? This is the number one thing that's that our, our nation is facing is, is responsible decision making an element of socio emotional learning, as well as self awareness, uh, the ability to recognize your own emotions and how they might influence your behavior. So having that uh, concept of your own implicit bias, if you will. Now, there's a lot of literature on the benefits of socio-emotional learning, and so improved attitudes and behaviors, better academic performance, less negative behaviors. And so I would say for all of you um, training physicians and CME, uh, reduced emotional stress is another one. And so this is a huge thing to think about is, um, you know, we know we have this epidemic of burnout prior to the pandemic. We already had the National Academy of Medicine, you know, uh, release, releasing the clinician well-being report. Um, and so now we face an even harder uh, um, uphill battle with, uh, burnout and exhaustion. And so this is where we can achieve cohesion. And so how can we do that? And why is um, networking important? I also wanted to interject this concept of, um, you know, people used to joke around with me about, you know, what, what, you know, you like to network, why do you like to network? Or, you know, why should I network? Some people do have to fight their introvert self to figure out how, why should they network at a conference? So this is actually 
Mark Granvetter, who's a sociologist, talks about the strength of the weak tie. And the idea here is that we all belong to different groups. And so I was putting in this slide uh, recently and I was like thinking of the, the bubble diagram and who we bubble with. And this is actually not the, a bubble diagram, but we all have strong ties. So that's sort of your the people that you know well and that know you very well. Um, and that uh, one, one thing that's interesting is some of us only connect with those strong Thai people, and that can be very limiting because, as he would describe, the people that you already know have already helped you as much as they can. And so it's really the people outside of the network, your friends' friends, who are going to actually transport you out of your box and allow you to seek new opportunities and new connections. And so if you think about um, you know, um, you know, it, LinkedIn jobs, you know, finding um, speaking opportunities um, or professional development for faculty, uh, particularly if you're talking about in academia where promotion and tenure is an issue, that's where you've got to mine your weak ties. And so um, I mentioned that because a lot of people say, well, you know, how does social media, you know, play into um, some of the work around promoting professional development? Um, and this is what it is. It's the strength of the weak tie. It really does keep that going. The other thing uh, to think about is that the reason um, I mentioned this also is that in terms of professional conferences and um, bringing, uh, bringing uh, professional conferences and restoring professional conferences, let's not get rid of the networking because that isn't a really important piece for that promotion and tenure and for those opportunities. And so we want to be careful there. Um, so moving on, um, you know, one of the things that we had done at Journal of Hospital Medicine, where I'm a social media editor, is we had started a CME accredited tweet chat. Um, it's been in place since 2017. It's the first CME journal-based tweet chat. There are a few other CME tweet chats that are more groups, but this is associated with the journal. And we have actually seen a huge engagement post COVID. And so I highlight this to say that uh, there's always that silver lining and people are getting a lot of interaction and engagement in, um, in on Twitter and on social media. And so you can use social media to advance adult learning and education. And this is just an example. We actually had a recent tweet chat on virtual learning communities. And um, one of the questions was, what would you like to see carry over from this era of virtual communities if we meet, when we can meet face to face again? And a few of the responses, flattened hierarchies, perhaps a virtual component to the meetings. Sometimes I really wanna go, but sometimes I don't have funds or travel time, which certainly will resonate with a lot of people right now. Um, and then I like this idea, maybe two tiers of registrations, one for in-person and another for virtual, still you can learn and engage. Um, and so this is just leading up to the pandemic, I accepted, excerpted just a few of our chats. And you can see here the first post-COVID chat is at 5 million impressions, oh, uh, oh, almost a thousand tweets, hundreds of participants, um, and actually uh, just looked at some of the more recent numbers. And this has maintained, we have maintained uh, roughly 5 million impressions with um, with many, many participants in the post-COVID era. And so I had not actually looked at the data in that lens before. Um, I'd always thought, okay, well, of course, people are interested in COVID, but it's another way to engage and get community, and people are highlighting the benefit of that community. Um, and so moving on, I highlight this because recently I was um, on the advisory uh, committee and a speaker for a Women in Medicine Summit uh, that is uh, based in Chicago, based in Chicago physically, but obviously occurred virtually this year. And a big part of the Women in Medicine Summit um, and the efforts around promoting women in medicine, as Daryl knows, is to really sponsor women, grow their network, make sure that um, they're getting out in front of people so they can get opportunities and get promoted. And so we had this idea taking the JHM chat model, which had been, uh, you know, it's been effectively run with Society of Hospital Medicine. And we partnered with Society of Hospital Medicine as our social media partner and, um, and created a pre-conference tweet chat. So we thought, well, how are we going to get people excited about this conference? Normally, we'd have a cocktail hour. We won't have a cocktail hour. We don't want to do a Zoom cocktail hour because they're going to be on Zoom for, the, for, for a long time. So how can we get people excited? So we, we started this Grow Your Network, um, a WIMS uh, Stronger Together um, social media tweet chat. 
And uh, we partnered with SHM, um, the digital media for a uh, fellow from um, SHM helped us. And um, the nice thing about this tweet chat is that anyone could come. You, it was like talking about what's gonna happen at the conference and a few questions. You were populating the tweets, you were getting people excited. Even if they didn't look at the tweet chat, they'd see it the next morning when they logged into the hashtag. So it's not a fresh hashtag the, the next morning that you're logging into. When you're watching the hashtag, you're like, oh, let me catch up on some of the tweets that occurred. So it gets things going a little bit before the conference and it pulls in late registrations even. So for this, the registration was still open and people wrote, oh, you know, I, I forgot to register. Oh, this looks great. I'm going to try to register to get the content uh, because the registration um, allowed you to not just get the live content, but get recorded content later. And so I mentioned this as a way to raise visibility and increase the learning um, receptivity of like, I want to learn. I, I see this cool crew that's tweeting about it. These are topics I'm interested in. You can keep it open and it's like an open house. Come on in and we're going to start our our, our chat tomorrow. Um, now, we also wanted to follow that with a um, a much more in-depth um, social networking hour. And so, um, you know, as you know, we, we people miss the networking. That's what they miss at conferences. And so we, we partnered, uh, we paired the two. Grow Your Network was the social media tweet chat, which has a low bar of participation. I mean, you can participate in a social media tweet chat just by following along and putting in one or two tweets. And then Know Your Network was the higher bar of participation. You had to be registered for the conference. Um, and it was BYOB. Um, and we were um, and we were going to have a virtual cocktail hour where you were going to have a round robin and go into different rooms and meet people. And so um, and so this actually occurred on that uh, first night of the conference. And so follow the tweet chat. It reserved um, mental capacity for one major social event as opposed to two. So the tweet chat doesn't take as much time. This takes a little bit more time. And, um, you know, you can kind of make it fun. And I, I posted this picture that I posted on Instagram of myself, like getting dressed up for this social hour that I was moderating. And I was thinking of myself as like a cruise ship um, social director. And I started off with that analogy. And I realized that's a very poor analogy for the time of COVID. So we, uh, we just left it at that. And the reason I was using the cruise ship analogy, and maybe it's better to say train, um, is that it was um, unlike other Zoom events where you can just come on in. This was one of those ones where you wanted to be able to board and get onto the, um, onto the social hour. And so we had a 15 minutes of just um, you know, some uh, introduction, introductory remarks and toasts um, before then we were like, okay, at this time, the social um, round robin starts. And so you have 15 minutes until the, sh the ship sails or until the train leaves the station, if you will. Um, and so, so that was an exciting uh, way to get people in and um, and we had um, really, really solid participation um, and a very smooth, um, smooth um, ride. So that was exciting. So with that, um, I actually don't have much else to say other than I was thinking, how could how could my experience with some of these uh, things during the pandemic help you? Um, and I will also say the other thing around faculty development, uh, which I don't have a formal slide on, but I certainly think a lot about, which is that I would never assume that anyone knows how to do this well. And so I think there's a huge role for societies to play in helping um, advance faculty understanding on how to do this. Um, even as simple as how do you run a Zoom poll? How do you even do breakout rooms? These are all, um, you know, I'm, I'm amazed at some of the things that I've learned about today um, in this session. And I would say my colleagues and many of the people I know would are, are still struggling with just the basics. And so, and then we have some people that are ready for some of those more advanced things. So don't forget that we probably need a range of experiences for people. And so I am super excited to learn more about virtual reality and some of the stuff that, um, and flipping the clinic and some of the stuff highlighted. I know some of my colleagues would just be grateful for a more in-depth training on how to run an effective Zoom webinar or Zoom teaching. And so let's not forget about going back to the basics for some of our faculty. And so with that, I'll go ahead and pause and turn it over to Daryl thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and in the spirit of flattening the hierarchy, uh, we're going to all call each other by our first names for uh, for this part of the of the session. I heard so many exciting concepts. I loved uh, the intelligence augmentation, the flip of AI, 
um, the, the flipping the clinic um, and engaging, really engaging patients. And of course, that important learning receptivity, sort of getting those tying those social and emotional bonds, all really um, wonderful, wonderful um, concepts. Um, I'm going to start us off with just a question in terms of, you know, there's been a lot um, in terms of the exacerbation of the already underlying health inequities that we were seeing in our society before COVID. And it's COVID has really ripped the seams open. I take care of patients uh, in Philadelphia where the average literacy level is fourth grade. Many of my um, patients don't have the capacity for video visits. If I'm lucky they have a home with a landline. Um, and so I think there are some challenges here around digital transformation in medical education, both for our clinicians on the front line and our patients. How do we, um, how do we help to heal um, those giant chasms and who are the other stakeholders that we need? And we'll just do a round robin, just jump in. I mean, one point on that, I think, you know, social determinants, and I think I mentioned digital determinants of health. Not everyone has 5G and a smartphone. Um, but they also, the idea that, you know, we, we all want to do precision medicine. We also need to think about precision connected mobile digital health to match the individual based on their age, culture, language, and location, not the same user interface or language grade level. Um, so I think there's opportunity not just have to dumb everything down, but have a bit of a spectrum. And now, just like you can, uh, in terms of flipping the clinic or uh, medical education, uh, really tune that to the individual. And I would think part of this future is, is to integrate that in, you know, your socioome, not just someone's age and, and, and vital signs uh, as part of how you communicate to somebody uh, going forward. So I can add, um, you know, uh, this is a great question. I, I'm on service, so I rounded this morning. And uh, for every discharge, I think we should really be we've always thought about a universal precautions approach around health literacy, for example, and teach back and medication reconciliation. And so more recently, we've been thinking about an e-health literacy approach, which is, you know, should we be asking patients, um, you know, what type of broadband do they have? Do they have a phone? Are they able to do a video visit? Um, and so, you know, when, when I discharge a COVID patient, we have a COVID telemedicine clinic that uh, visit for them. And then a uh, Follow up. I, I should know as the hospital is discharging them if they're going to have difficulty with that, and then I can um, recruit more help for them. And so, um, so I would say we shouldn't be um, the digital divide is there, but we should be cautious and use that universal precautions approach to try to mobilize resources um, to figure out how to help the patients that need it most. And I know there's a lot of interesting tech. Um, uh, ways in order to mobilize those resources. So, um, so that, I've, that I've heard about some that we use in our hospital that we can get to. Yeah, and on that point, just to add on a little bit here, one of the things that I've often worried about is when I worked at, you mentioned Khan Academy and Osmosis, is am I just helping the students and the families that kind of are fine and would have figured it out anyway? Uh, or am I, in, in a way, am I making things worse, like the chasm worse, like those that aren't going to be motivated to go online or now further behind, you know, things like that. And I, and I really struggle with that because I think a lot of technology ends up being a magnifier. If there's a small gap, now it's a slightly bigger gap. I think that one thing that can help to close the gap is things like making sure we think about translation work. So if I can make a video that, that is understandable in Spanish and Farsi and Hindi and Urdu. And if I can get that video at a, let's say sixth grade level and really focus on just like the key points, right? Like what's the core message? And if I can get that playing in a emergency room, uh, let's say waiting room. Now I've kind of helped to make that family feel a little bit more welcome. And they're sitting there, they're kind of motivated anyway at that point, you know, they've already made their way to the waiting room. It's probably not too much more difficulty, you know, in getting them to watch that versus watching the cartoon that otherwise would be playing. Like that's a really concrete thing we can do. And I've seen a lot of success with that where families will say, yeah, actually, I really like the video. I understand what a heart attack is now. And I wouldn't have understood from my doctor because even through the translation services, it's kind of hard to figure it out. Great, thank you. You know, one of the major um, concerns that we all have uh, for all of our healthcare clinicians is are the high rates of burnout and the lack of professional satisfaction. 
we're now seeing these tsunamis of data hitting our clinicians, hitting our patients. And so I guess my question is in terms of sifting through the noise, how, to, how do societies help their members uh, sift through this? Uh, how do we get our patients through it and the other members of our healthcare team so that we can get to a better place? I can start off with that and say, I am worried. I am really worried that the, um, you know, we have a pandemic um, and what the, um, one of the outcomes we need to follow is clinician retention. I, I think that people will retire early. I think we are going to see exit out of the workforce in a way that we have not dealt with before. Um, I think that um, we have trainees who are concerned and not sure what their job opportunities are ahead, ahead of them because of the financial um, health of the health sector, you know? And so um, whenever we have that, we need to be really concerned. I do think that the role of societies is to provide a community. And, and I know that a lot of societies view themselves as, um, you know, stewards of education. I would also say you're a steward of that community. And a great example I think is of IDSA. You know, when I think about the people I'm most concerned about, it's my infectious disease doctors, uh, because they are, they have been out in front of this for, for so long and now we're, they're tired and we're surging again and they're being dragged through the mud, you know, um, you know because they're the public face of, of the pandemic and all of the information that needs to go out to our community. And so um, I think when I, you know, when I saw the IDSA uh, meeting was occurring, I was, I was grateful. I was like, okay, they're, they're having their meeting. They, they are having great speakers. They seemed positive um, because that community is important. And so I think we always think of an event sometimes as being, oh, we have to have an event around a, a, a speaker. You know, I've, I've actually seen more recently successful events around just bringing people together virtually to say, we're going to talk. And so I think that's something that, um, you know, a low cost way of bringing people together would be really helpful to let people know they're not alone. We've seen that a lot in the Facebook communities. And so I think societies can also learn from that as well. You know, our, our so thank you for sh sharing that, Vinny. And, and as an infectious disease doctor, I appreciate the, the comment. I, uh, I think Dr. Fauci more than anyone is at, at this moment in time, a, a beacon of hope for, for most folks. And it's certainly a person I look up to uh, and admire greatly. Um, I think the other thing is that Black Lives Matter is happening in parallel with COVID. So there's a lot of angst around race, race relations as well. And for me, a lot of this comes back to our general framework of like disease care versus well care, which I think is uh, a spin of what Daniel was showing as well. Like, I think if we start recognizing that you know, medicine is not just the absence of disease, but the optimization of health. If we really embrace that and recognize that if we can kind of do that for ourselves, then we can kind of be good stewards of that. That's the key. And I think, um, you know, there, there's a statistic that I, that I like to quote, which is that um, med students are roughly age match cohort wise, 200% at risk for suicide versus anyone else out there. That's crazy. 2X the risk of suicide. That's a hard outcome. And there's a real reason for that. It comes down to student debt, you know, not feeling like you're really valued as a human being. You're kind of a cog in a machine. You're just following orders that are being taught to you by a bot. You know, these feelings are real. And I think the more we can kind of stress for folks that they need to fill their cup first, and that that doesn't mean that they're soft and moving away from even things like um, burnout to words like moral injury and recognizing it's the system that's at play here, I think really makes people feel much more empowered. Yeah, those are great points. I think one piece of that is is you know bringing in design thinking into the whole healthcare experience, whether it's um, how you because uh, health is social, med ed is social, the esprit de corps is critical. Um, how do you design in debriefs where folks can vent after a challenging bad outcome, or um, uh, back to the burnout element, better design ways so we're not stuck uh, with the burdens of fax machines or lots of apps to log into and password uh, fatigue uh, so that sort of the, the the it's not data it's insights that are brought um, uh, all the way to from how you design the, the physical space to, to the to the virtual one all those can probably be helpful in, in small amounts but when you put them together they're they're um, they can move the needle um, but first step is recognition which I think is now there and then 
potentially learning from even other worlds uh, to design solutions. Thank you. Um, critical, critical issue for all of us to think about. Um, um, Daniel, we got a, a question from one of our attendees in terms of how does the consumer, and in this place, the hospital, the clinician, know that the products they are collecting patient information with are safe and reliable? Are there criteria that these digital uh, tools must meet? That's, I think, a super question and a hot topic. I mean, for some tools, uh, you know, it has to go through the right FDA clearance. Like, you know, here's a, a blood pressure cuff built into a watch that had to go through steps to show it was matching the, the standards of, uh, of measuring a, a vital sign. There's now uh, platforms that are coming out, one with FDA clear, that can track blood pressure with just a patch or on a watch band. So those have to go through clearances. You can also buy from, you know, out of China, $20 Apple-esque watch that claims to do blood pressure measurement. For some things, it matters, like blood pressure, blood sugar. Others, you know, your steps, if they're off by 10%, not dramatic, it may be the trend lines are important. Um, but there are societies like the Digital Medicine Society trying to now create a bit of a playbook about how do you measure uh, uh, the quality of sleep or uh, respiratory status. So um, I guess it depends on what you're dealing with. I wouldn't discount sort of the the uh, patient reported data that can come from from simple wearables, even tracking sleep, which is so critical to activity. Uh, and clearly it's a, a blend. And now the FDA is moving to this world of um, uh, software as a medical device. And so the regulatory process is accelerating and there'll be better ways to trust these things. Uh, and hopefully they tie that into continuous care. Wonderful, thank you. I just want to do a quick round robin with with you. If you needed to tell our, our our medical societies, our CMSS members, the one or two top things that they need to make sure is happening right now in their medical education shops around a digital transformation, what would it be? I'll go first. I'd say it's not any one thing, uh, and but. Uh, there, we need to accelerate and move from incremental medicine to a bit of exponential. Some of that is embracing some of these new digital virtual tools. And so part of that is not waiting for every new app or device or service to go through a pilot at your place. But you know, you've got patients with hypertension, try uh, prescribing them a connected blood pressure cuff and hopefully eventually getting that paid for. If you have your own medical issue, start to look for apps, tools, devices, and solutions that might work for your need and then start to integrate those in your clinical care pathways in some form. So, you know, the future's already here. It's just not evenly distributed. It's a famous quote from William Gibson. Um, we need sort of to have folks on the leadership level step up and start to uh, not wait for the 10-year double-blind placebo-controlled trial for some platform that will be antique by then um, to start to accelerate utilization and positive impact. To play off of that a little bit, I think if we accept the fact that our future is going to have a lot of digital inputs, then it begs the question, how do we train humans? And I think the key is to train humans to both understand the digital input, like having that cognitive understanding, but then really to, to really put emphasis on the human skill. Like I, th I think it stands to reason that human beings for the foreseeable future will want to be in touch with and relate to other human beings. And we see this now with COVID more than ever and really teaching skills like communication, empathy, connectivity, like understanding how to be vulnerable, how to speak compassionately. I think those are the things that we should focus really heavy, heavily on with our, with our academic training of, of healthcare professionals. That might also play into who you select for, for let's say medical school. It's not just being good at organic chemistry and, and physics. Uh, it's maybe softer social skills. We don't need to memorize so much because we have everything accessible 24 seven. So it may, might be the selection metric as well. Growth totally. I, then you um, get the last word. Thank you. I um, I would say first, uh, reward and share innovation. Um, I think a lot of us are struggling. I mean, even today, I was like, you know, how can I round my with my team together and do teaching with a number of people? And what, you know, asking people, like, how have you been doing this? Um, and so creating that community for those ideas to form. Um, and the second is recognize expertise in this area. Um, so I think it's, you know, there's some people that are just naturally good at this, um, that have learned on their own how to use technology to teach. Um, and unlike faculty development programs in education that many of our societies have, there is no certificate or badge to say, I'm that Zoom person who can help you. 
And I think with a lot of our, especially our junior faculty, um, especially in academia, uh, but even in private practice, you know, there, there needs to be some reward and recognition that this is a skill and that you can skill up for it, but you can also be acknowledged for that skill. And that would really help those people really market themselves um, to others and elevate the playing field for everybody. I like leaving it on a positive note. With that, I want to thank our panelists for really a fabulous um, session. Um, and um, thank you for, for spending the last hour with us. Yeah. Dr. Burstyn, do you have any final I words? To add my thanks to you and the panel. Uh, it was sort of one of those times where I feel like my fingers couldn't type fast enough of trying to capture all those ideas. Uh, but uh, thanks again for kind of helping us think really broadly. I, I do want to come back to Vinny's comment, which I thought was just so powerful that we have to also think about the role of societies as more than just our, our role in education, but also our role in terms of bringing people together and how powerful that is and using these tools as adjuncts to do that, but they're not the be all end all. So uh, delighted to have you join us this afternoon. Just a quick reminder, we will have our uh, virtual cocktails at 6 p.m. Eastern time. And just one last uh, thanks to our uh, industry sponsors and of course to our meeting sponsor, Pocori, uh, for helping us uh, share this really important content. And thanks to all of you for joining us. And uh, we are uh, adjourned for the afternoon. Thank you again. Bye, everybody. <laughs>